Hi, my name is Lex Williford, and welcome to the Contemporary Short Story. In this presentation, I'll talk a bit about a few of my own experiences, as I've tried to learn as much as I could about the Contemporary Short Story. And then I'll give you an overview of almost everything I know about the Contemporary Story, after years of reading thousands of stories, and becoming something of an accidental anthologist. In this overview, part one, I'll discuss the two main short story renaissances of the 20th century and how the latest has hurtled us into the early 21st century. Then I hope to give you enough information so that you can begin studying the contemporary short story in more depth on your own. In this overview, I'll discuss a few anthologies that every short story writer should read, discuss the anthology I put together myself with my co-editor Michael Martone, then discuss the varied voices and story forms and structures that represent the wide variety of stories being written by the most gifted writers in the U.S. and elsewhere. In part two, I'll discuss some of the major magazines publishing the short story and some of the venues contemporary writers go to when they want to submit their stories to literary and slick magazines. I'll also discuss in some depth supplements I've been developing for years that I use when submitting short stories myself, supplements that I share with my students so that they can submit their own stories too. When I first entered a Masters of the Fine Arts program to study fiction writing in the mid-80s, even after I'd already written a collection of stories as my thesis and received a Masters in English, I still knew next to nothing about the contemporary short story, and students entering the MFA program with me didn't know much either. If the MFA students I taught over the years are any indication, my experience was almost universal. The most contemporary writers many MFA students have read by the time they enter graduate school are writers of the so-called modernist canon, mostly men, mostly white, mostly dead, <laughs> from the early to mid-20th century. Anton Chekhov, Virginia Woolf, Franz Kafka, Catherine Mansfield, James Joyce, Willa Cather, Sherwood Anderson, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, Ralph Ellison, Miss Eudora Welty, and the great precursors to the postmodern and magical realist eras Jorge Luis Borges and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. As with many of the graduate students I've taught, the goddess I worshipped during my early graduate school years was, of course, Flannery O'Connor, whose writing during the 50s and 60s had more to do with the second great renaissance of the short story of the 20th century, perhaps, than any other writer. O'Connor's work is terrific, of course, but it's hardly contemporary. What I didn't know at the time, the year of Orwell, 1984 and beyond, was that the United States and the world were undergoing a remarkable short story renaissance, unlike any other since the 1920s, some 60 years before. And that renaissance, I argue now, is still very much alive in the early 21st century, partly because of the proliferation of creative writing programs since the founding in the late 40s of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, where Flannery O'Connor and many other writers from her generation studied. The quantity and quality of short stories being written, and the venues for pu publishing them, the New Yorker, Esquire, the Atlantic Monthly, and Harper's, as well as such venerable literary magazines as the Virginia Quarterly Review, the Georgia Review, and the Kenyon Review, and a sudden influx of new literary upstarts like Granta and George Plimpton's The Parish Review, have made a giant leap in just a few decades since the 1960s and 70s. Such writers as John Cheever, Grace Paley, John Updike, Cynthia Ozick, and one of the true harbingers of trends in postmodern fiction, John Barth, began a revolution in the short story form, one that was only beginning. And young writers who'd studied at Iowa and its many offshoots in the last three decades of the 20th century were transforming the short story into an exciting and innovative new fictional form, even at times eclipsing the revolutionary changes in the contemporary realist, magical realist, and postmodern forms of the novel. <laughs> 
The diverse new voices that emerged changed everything. Raymond Carver, Tobias Wolfe, Andre Debus Sr., Jane Ann Phillips, Joy Williams, and Bobby Ann Mason, Ann Beatty, Bob Shakochis, Louise Erdrich, Sherman Alexi, Lori Moore, Barry Hanna, the new goddess I would come to worship in recent years, the Canadian writer Alice Munro, and many more. When we're undergraduates receiving bachelor's degrees, we think we know everything, right? <laughs> but when we enter graduate school, say an MFA program, we soon realize we know almost nothing. Once, in my first semester MFA fiction workshop, I received a few harsh comments from the professor, a writer and graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and that same generation of men returning from World War II. Tough guys whose workshop sometimes felt a bit like boot camp. Okay, um, what can I do to improve, I asked him after class. Read all the stories you can, he said. You know, the contemporary stuff. My writing, he'd said earlier in workshop, was almost anachronistic, overly formal, ornate, gaudy, rococo even, and a bit maudlin. Nothing like my own authentic voice, a kind of imitation of voices long dead, a throwback to the early 20th century, and maybe even before. Nobody writes like Poe, Hawthorne, or even Faulkner anymore, he said. You know that, right? Okay, so where can I read some of this contemporary stuff? I started to ask him, but he'd already walked off to his office. I didn't know where to begin or where to look. Luckily, around that same time, R.V. Castle, a contemporary short story writer of some note, and the editor of the Norton Anthology of Short Fiction I'd used in composition classes when I was working on my master's degree. That's it on the left, a photo of my signed copy of the second edition, now in its seventh edition, co-edited by Richard Bausch, came to the university as a visiting writer touting the publication of his new anthology, the Norton Anthology of Contemporary Fiction. That's it on the right, co-edited with Joyce Carol Oates. After we talked a bit about a new story I'd written, I asked Castle where I should go to read all the contemporary stories I could. Start with the annuals, he said, and please, call me Verlin. Then he referred me to the Best American Stories series and the O. Henry Prize stories, which I'd heard of but never looked up in the library. Read every annual published in the last 30 years, he said, and grinned. I will, I said. Then go to the regional annuals, he said, and he pointed out a few. New stories from the South and multi-genre annuals like the Pushcart Prize anthologies. All right, I said, I'll read those too. Then he said, buy as many anthologies of the contemporary short story you can afford and read the stories again and again. I'll do it, I said. Then I thanked him, a man who'd been remarkably open and generous and I decided to name a character after him in the new story I was revising. That story won the first award I'd ever gotten for my writing, and our talk started me on a journey towards being an anthologist, though I didn't know it at the time. In the years since Castle helped me, the more contemporary short stories I've read, the more hungry and infatuated by the form I've become. I've probably read every contemporary anthology out there cover to cover, and more than once. The best of these, I think, are Joyce Carol Oates' Contemporary American Short Fiction, Porter Shreve and Bich Min Nien's The Contemporary American Short Story, and 3030, 30, 30 American Stories from the Last 30 Years, Raymond Carver and Tom Jenks' American Short Story Masterpieces, Tobias Wolfe's The Vintage Book of Contemporary American Short Stories, and Ron Hansen and Jim Shepard's You've Got to Read This, Contemporary American Writers Introduced Stories That Held Them in Awe. But there are many more, all deserving of a close read, some of them that push the boundaries of traditional form, such as Robin Henley and Michael Martone's Extreme Fiction, Fabulists and Formalists, which I'll say something about in a moment. For some reason, after I'd read every contemporary short story anthology I could find, I felt that somehow the anthologies I'd read had all begun to repeat many of the same stories again and again, 
that a somewhat narrow traditional contemporary canon was evolving, perhaps too quickly, at times based less upon the quality of the story, say, than on the editors themselves and the favorite stories of the writers they already knew. In retrospect, I realized that perhaps I was wrong about this alleged editorial bias, but I began wondering if there weren't also a way to democratize the editorial selection process and the whole evolution of the contemporary canon so that more diverse voices could be heard. That's when I approached Michael Martone, a very different kind of writer than I am, not at all a traditional realist writer like me, whose work is known for its voice work often complex internal monologues, and its brilliant formal innovation and experimentation. He signed on to a project that would survey contemporary teaching writers from North America known for their own short stories, traditional and experimental. And then Martone and I, two writers with utterly different aesthetics, would choose among those stories and create a new, different kind of anthology, something that would eventually become the Scribner Anthology of Contemporary Short Fiction now in its second edition. When our survey was complete and all the nominations were in, we gathered all the nominated stories together, some of them more difficult to find than we thought, many of them stories we'd never even heard of, and we began selecting stories from among them with one main goal in mind. Mostly, we wanted the anthology to represent the widest range of traditional realist and modernist narratives, as well as what had become known somewhat loosely as postmodern narratives. Let me take a few moments to explain. In traditional linear narratives, as my co-editor Michael Martone and Robin Henley write in the introduction of their own distinctive anthology, Extreme Fiction, the realist writer seeks a certain kind of transparency. Quote, to create an illusion so perfect that the reader cannot tell it is an illusion. The reader observes the action, whether exterior or interior, as it takes place in real space and in real time. The story unfolds before our eyes. The writer does this through concreteness, using specific sensory details in the language and in the images the language creates. Abstractions are to be avoided. The realist story wants you, the reader, to forget you are reading. Traditional linear narratives then create this effect, what John Gardner calls a vivid and continuous dream, and they are almost always anti-contrivance and anti-artifice, trying to hide the very effects writers work so hard to create. Instead of making readers aware of the artifice of the story, the realist writer tries to lull readers to a waking dream state, to create the illusion of experience, to slip into the world and consciousness of a character so effectively that, effectively, we become the character and experience what she experiences. To create such an effect as one student of John Gardner, the well-known realist and champion of the new minimalism of the 80s, Raymond Carver, advises writers, no tricks. But of course, many writers are tricksters, and they thumb their noses at such prescriptive advice and traditional rules of almost every kind. We'll get to them in a bit. Many of these contemporary traditional realist narratives, as Martone and Hemley go on, continue to cling to the premises of modernist narratives. Quote, Modernist prose writers chronicled and to various degrees mourned the death of the old order, as represented by family, country, and God. Personal narrative and fragmentation took precedence in their writing, replacing the omniscient narrators and, quote, grand narratives, the story of America's founding, the westward expansion of the pioneers of earlier generations, and tended to challenge those narratives while maintaining a keen nostalgia for the good old days. The fragmentation of modern life for the modernist writers, Faulkner in The Sound and the Fury, Virginia Woolf in To the Lighthouse, Hemingway in A Clean, Well-Lighted Place, was disconcerting and sometimes left their protagonists committing suicide, or murdered and unmourned, or simply afraid of the dark and oblivion. 